Um, I was asked to say a few words about the financial governance after the crisis. Of course, this is a vast topic. I will. I decided to concentrate on the, the, the areas where I have some direct experience. I've been uh, the executive director for Brazil and uh, some other countries in the IMF since 2007. And so my, my arrival in Washington antedates the eruption of the crisis by a few months. It really began a few months after I arrived uh, with the first pro symptoms of problems in the U.S. financial system and then spread quickly over into Europe. Where the areas which I will deal with in, in uh, this presentation are basically the IMF itself, of course, the G20, and the, the BRICS where I've had direct participation since in the last five or six years. I will leave out a whole host of other financial governance issues that are very important, like the World Bank, the regional development banks, the FSB, the Financial Stability Forum, uh, the regional financial arrangements like Shanghai, like the ESM, European Monetary System. So it's a very partial view, but at least it has the advantage of being a view someone who was directly involved in this in, the, in, the, in these last years. I, I hope I can make this interesting for you, um, although I must say, <laughs> contrary to what Jan has just said, that the presence of the fourth power constrains my ability <laughs> to, be, to make it as interesting as I, as I perhaps could. <laughs> but anyway, transparency is, is also important. Now. Um, the, the, the crisis that erupted in the financial system as of the U.S. and Europe has often been called a global crisis, but in reality, this is a misnomer. It's mostly a, cri a North Atlantic financial crisis, I'd say, that migrated, that uh, had substantial effects in the rest of the world. Né? Now, the, it was, of course, a major shock, a major blow to status quo, to established ways of thinking about economic policy, to governance structures, no doubt about it. It was a major shock, a major blow. But uh, five or six years later, what can we say? Um, has this major blow had a lasting effect? Has it produced major changes? I would say that it, it's fair, I think it's fair to say that uh, Despite the, the size of the shock, there has been no overhaul of the government sy governance system, governance system of the of the financial area. Well, this governance system, I think, this is an, one of the points I'll, I'll try to make is is we can say a Western-dominated governance structure. Right? By that I mean fundamentally U.S. and Europe. Right? These these governance structures have been affected by the crisis. Changes have occurred, but these changes are not, do not amount to a, what, what I could say, what we could call an overhaul of the entire system, despite uh, our efforts to move change forward. By we, we mean, I mean uh, emerging markets, huh? or some emerging markets. But there have been, I think, significant changes. For example, in 2009, uh, and in fact, since the end of 2008, one major change occurred, which was the effective replacement of the G7 by the G20 as a main forum for economic and financial discussions. The G20 existed already. It was created, in fact, at the American initiative, at, a, at an American initiative during the Clinton administration, right after the the outbreak of the East Asian crisis in 1997. But it was a ministerial forum that effectively um, deteriorated, I would say, into a sort of deputies forum, where advisors from these 20 countries met and discussed periodically, but with no major importance. This up to the crisis. And then when the crisis, especially after Lehman, the United States and other advanced countries decided to, up, to accept an upgrading of the G20 to a leaders forum. And the first meeting was in Washington, December 2008. I must say that Brazil played a role there. 
President Lula played a role there, and Brazil had, a, had the opportunity to play a role maximized by the fact that Brazil was the presiding the G20 in the year of the crisis, the G20 in its old format. So Brazil, in an understanding with other emerging markets, w countries, and with uh, the United States notably, and other advanced economies, managed to upgrade the status of the G20 in a major way. Now, the G20, of course, as you know, has the G7, all the G7 countries in there, but also a number of emerging market countries, Brazil, Russia, India, uh, China, Argentina, Turkey, Indonesia, uh, and a few others. And so it's, it's a more balanced structure where uh, discussions are, where the voice of emerging market countries can be heard. No? So this, is, this was an important progress. The other, th the other thing is that the, at the level of the IMF, we made some reforms of the voting power structure. The first one was the 2008 reform that is already in force that shifted quotas and voting power to emerging markets. Brazil, for example, gained from that. And then in 2010, during the Korean presidency of the G20, we negotiated a second reform of the fund, which shifts further quotas to emerging market and developing countries. Brazil, again, is one of the main gainers. China is the main gainer after that Brazil. But this second reform is not yet in force. And it was conceived as a second step. And as part of the agreement, further steps were foreseen. So it, it, was, it was accepted by countries like Brazil, China, India, Russia, and others that we would move gradually towards a, a change in the governance of institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, through agreements negotiated at the level of the G20. Um, in uh, another important progress that I would highlight, you know, I'll just give you, I'll just quote a, a colleague of mine, or the Russian executive director at the fund, Alexei Morgen, has been there for more than 20 years. He's the Russian Kafka, with those, with Alexander Kafka, I mean, not first. And uh, Alexei Morgen once said in a Brookings Institution event that in all his time at the fund, the main governance change he saw was the, the creation of the BRICS as an articulation, as a form for articulate, articulating positions. Initially, it was Brazil, Russia, India, and China, later joined by South Africa. No? And in fact, there is this coordination. It was started at, by the Russians, really. Although some Brazilians say that Brazil was started it, in reality, Russia gave the initial push. When I arrived in 2007 in Washington, there was no such thing as BRICS. It was just an acronym used by, what's his name? Uh, Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs, yeah. I forget the, name, the economist's name. Jim O'Neill. But it had no political reality. In 2008, at the initiative of Russia, an articulation began at the leaders' level, at the ministerial level, at the level of executive directors in the fund, at the level of executive directors in the World Bank. And this is working, working irregularly, sometimes not so efficiently, sometimes not as far as we could go, but it, it's working. And um, I would say, for example, that setting modesty aside a little bit, that if you look at the 24 chairs of the fund, of the fund's board, I would say that Brazil's, Russia's, and India's chairs are clearly among the most active and most present in the discussions, in the, in the, in the process. China less so. China's more discreet, maybe more long-term thinking, less, less, uh, I'll come back to that a little bit. But um, it's, China's a very peculiar country, eh? difficult to understand. But I think that uh, the, the, these four countries, that later joined by South Africa, have been acting jointly in a major way and are perceived by, by the G7 as um, an interlocutor. It has happened, for example, that uh, we, of we often meet as BRICS on the sidelines of IMF or G20 events. It's often the case. No? It has happened twice that the Secretary of the Treasury has asked to join our meeting. <laughs> Tim Geithner twice asked to join our meeting. The first time he did that was a complete surprise. 
and then, uh, he, of course, he did not participate in the entire meeting. He had, a, he had a message he wanted to convey to the BRICS on both occasions, and he had a dialogue with us and then, of course, left so that we could have our own private conversation. This is a symptom of, of the increasing relevance of this um, articulation. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a few examples of the progress we've made in terms of governance since the crisis. <coughs> but the truth is that since 2011, 11, this governance reform process has largely ground to a halt. And we've suffered some setbacks. One reason probably is that as the crisis in the advanced economies receded or became less acute, they felt less of a need to reach out to to emerging market countries and developing countries as a whole. And there is this temptation to go back to the old style international governments, governance, US, European exclusiveness. Huh? There's this temptation. It hasn't been fully exercised, but it's, it's there. So for example, I'll give you examples of the sort of setbacks that we've been suffering in more recent years. In 2000, and since 2011, since the French presidency of the G20, the G20 has become mired in stalemates. So little was accomplished during the French presidency, even less during the Mexican presidency of 2012. And disappointingly, even less during the Russian presidency of the G20. I was saying to my Russian colleagues, I'm going to pass a resolution of the BRICS prohibiting any of the BRICS to take in the presidency of the G20. <laughs> because once, once a BRIC, this is a problem, you know, this may be something that goes deeper. Although emerging market countries are having an increasing role in the, in the, in the world, they, they still don't have the assertiveness that Europeans and Americans have. No? So when the Russians take on the presidency of the G20, they assume a neutrality that makes us lose one of us. You know, I was telling them, look, please do something. You have a Russian president, but you have to have a Russian chair, right? Well, like the French did in 2011. You have to have a Russian speaking for Russia. <laughs> but um, this didn't work well. Didn't work well at all. So that's at the G level of the G20. At the level of the fund, we've missed um, a number of important target dates. The target date for the entry into force of the 2010 quota and governance reform was October 2012. We're, we're, we're approaching October 2013, and the reform has not entered into force. Why? Fundamentally because it requires a supermajority of 85% of voting power, and the United States Congress has failed to rat ratify the reform. And we have no clear idea of how, how this would move forward. At the same time, we had a date, target date for the reform of the quota formula, which is the main determinant of the distribution of voting power. That was January 2013. We missed it. Due, in that case, to the resistance of the Europeans. Because the Europeans, I would say, the best organized bloc. It's a, it's a sort of a paradox, because you, you, Europe is very divided, even in the Euro area. No? They, they fight a lot among each other, and they even publicly. But when they come to the fund or to the G20, they act en bloc in a very efficient manner, much more than the BRICS, needless to say. And it's a much deeper integration, a much closer political alliance. It's a major, major bloc in terms of coordination. Sometimes when I become impatient, I. I have the urge to say, let's start establish a rule here in the, in the board of the IMF. Let's simply assume that once, one, if one of the seven year area directors speaks, we can simply register that all the others agree, instead of having to hear the same message seven times. <laughs> but I haven't been successful so far <laughs> with this idea. In any case, um, we missed this, and we, we have a further target date that we may, may, we, we may miss too, which is January 2014, which is the completion of the next general quarter review. So European unwillingness to move forward, 
combined with American incapacity to ratify in Congress, has built a situation where the, where the reform process itself has become uh, has stalled, has stalled in a major way. Now this is this rebounds on the G20. Why? Because the political agreement that guides the the process of reform of the fund was made at the level of the G20 in 2009 and notably in during the Korean presidency in 2010 where good progress was made. What was this political agreement in a nutshell? The political agreement was the G20 agrees at the highest possible level to to boost the size of the fund through borrowing arrangements, including with contributions, sizable contributions from emerging market countries, from the BRICS in particular, in exchange for the, for the commitment to reform the fund, to make it legitimate, to make it credible, to make it reflect the realities of the current world economy. economy eh? The first part is there. The second is stalled. So this is a delicate situation because although the BRICS so far and the other emerging market countries have not made much of a public issue of this matter, as time goes by, we have, we have a, a possibility of a, a crisis of legitimacy of the IMF, of the, of the G20 itself. No? if a clear political agreement is not uh, followed through. At the risk of digressing a little bit, can I just, can I try to lay, take a, a long view of this issue? Maybe I'm being influenced by Chinese, contacts with Chinese, so Chinese sense of time. This is so, this, this uh, comment attributed to Zhu Enlai, I don't know if it's authentic. At, some, at one point in the 60s or 70s, they, someone asked him what he thought in, in the end of the French Revolution. He's supposed to have replied, it's too early to tell, no? <laughs> so let's, let me try to take a long view. What we're dealing with here, really, I think it's, is the end of an era, right? Which had, uh, uh, an American-Hungarian historian called John Lukacs he proposed that we call it not the modern age, as is usually done, but the European age. Something that began around the time of the Renaissance and the great navigations, and that has effectively ended, or is, is, is petering out. No? Europe is in relative decline. The major outpost of the European civilization, the most important one, which is the United States, is also, I believe, in relative decline. And the traditional civilizations that were submerged by the European dominance during the European age, China, India, for example, are all rising and rising fast. No? So the, the, what is the problem that this poses for, for, for the governance of, of uh, financial institutions, for international governments, is that the, the structures we have today, they were, they were built when Europe was much more important than it is now. And the United States was much more important than it is now. Right? And these institutions have enormous inertia, enormous inertia, resistance to change. So this creates a conflict between the reality of an increasingly powerful China, increasingly powerful India, rising Sub-Saharan Africa, rising Brazil, increasingly influential. The alliance of the four or five large powers from the periphery of the international system, which is clearly conceived by them as, some, as a counterpoint to the Western-dominated governance structures. You, you will not find this, made, this point made so clearly always. You know, there's a lot of diplomacy, a lot of, uh, I have to be careful with what I'm going to say. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, hesitation in, in bringing out these, co these contrasts, these conflicts. But that's what's uh, in reality uh, going on. How, just to, to finalize this, uh, this presentation, how are we reacting to, this, to, this, to these setbacks that I mentioned before? I think uh, one of the main reactions, and possibly the, the most effective one,
is a deepening of the cooperation among the BRICS. Since uh, last year, the BRICS entered into a new phase, a phase that has not received much attention here in Brazil, I believe. But it's moving forward, I can tell you. It's moving forward step by step. It's not easy. We're entering into a phase of constructing our own institutional arrangements, self-managed. So in New Delhi, when the BRICS leaders met last year, they announced the, the, they asked their finance ministers to examine the viability and feasibility of creating a BRICS-led development bank. And then when they met in Los Cabos mid last year, they asked their finance ministers, central bank governors, to examine the feasibility and viability of constructing a reserve pooling arrangement among the BRICS, an international reserve pooling arrangement. After Los Cabos, Brazil was charged with coordinating the, the reserve pooling arrangement. And uh, since New Delhi, China, sorry, South Africa and India were charged with coordinating the bank. I'm involved with the, with the, with the reserve pooling arrangement. And so I know, I know what's going on there in detail. The bank I, I'm less, I'm less uh, involved with. But most, both things move forward. And when the leaders of the BRICS met in Durban in March this year, an important decision was taken to create the bank and to create the reserve pooling arrangement. That was March this year. And the process has continued. The, the, the decision was to establish a contingent reserve arrangement uh, of the value of $100 billion and a reserve and a development bank with a subscribed capital of $50 billion. But this latter value was only confirmed now when the, when the BRICS leaders met again in St. Petersburg earlier this month. Huh? So these, these two things are moving forward. To give you an idea, uh, for the BRICS contingent reserve arrangement, we're already in the phase of drafting the first version of the legal text that we hope to discuss when the, the BRICS meet again in Washington in two weeks. So the process is ongoing. It's, uh, there's no, the BRICS continue to engage in a, what they hope will be a constrict, constructive dialogue with the North Atlantic powers. This is ongoing, we're, we're, we're there in the fund, we're active in the fund, we're active in the G20. But at the same time, we are doing our best to construct our own institutional structures. The bank is a response, to the, the, the BRICS bank, the BRICS-led bank is a response to the fact that the World Bank is also stalled in its own difficulties. And the contingent reserve arrangement is what you can call a, a monetary fund of the BRICS, an embryonic monetary fund of the BRICS. So of course, everything is very difficult, I can tell you. It's a, difficult process, five sovereign countries with different views, huh? different de all the details have to be discussed. It's quite a challenge, but it's moving forward, it's moving forward. And so the, the issue for the multilateral structures, the World Bank, the Fund, the G20, is whether they can be effective enough to, dis to, to, to bring trust in a changing world, or whether they will be holding back, sticking to their accustomed ways of working, and stimulating a fragmentation of the system, which will inevitably occur. So this is, in a nutshell, I hope I, I could make this vast topic somewhat interesting to you, and uh, I'm ready to answer any questions that, we, that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Katarina Pistor from Columbia Law School. I very much enjoyed your presentation, in particular the willingness to have these sweeping thoughts about an era coming to an end. And in that mode, I just want to suggest that maybe also a particular form of governance <coughs> might be coming to, to an end. And 
what might also be happening at the same time as you're describing the shift towards a BRICS type of monetary regime or, or bank is that the Atlantic powers actually relying increasingly on what Leonardo this morning called sort of a private governance structure or lobbying governance structure. So the major global financial centers are still in the North Atlantic realm. You know, China is picking up a little bit, but still London and New York and Frankfurt, and there's also a lot of private governance there. So I'm just wondering what you might think about the intersection of an increasing enabling private governance regime in the North Atlantic world that affects the global world, of course, um, where there might actually be, you know, changing the mode of governance rather than only a shift, a geographic shift of governance. As Luis Fernando de Paul, I am professor of University of the State of Rio de Janeiro. My, my question is about, uh, uh, you are talking about multilateral relationship, governance. How about Mercosul? Right? We, are, we, are, is, we have this agreement, uh, trade agreement, and uh, in terms of the multilateral, multilateral governance, are you trying to do some, something in this special concern? I'll take three, and then I'll, I'll take three first. Yeah. Paul McCulley here. I have a simple question for you. You were observing the tug of war between emerging markets and the developed world in the governance, funding, and mission of the IMF. Simple question, when the next time the top job at the IMF comes available, do you anticipate that the emerging markets will gather together collectively to break the feudalism of the World War II established governance structure? Okay, I'll, I'll try to answer these these three questions. First on the question on the left, sorry I didn't catch your name, Katarina, from the Law School of Columbia. Um, I think this, um, this, this governance by lobby, to borrow an expression that was used by Leonardo this morning, has weakened enormously the, the leadership capacity of the, the North Atlantic, especially the United States perhaps. And, and um, and perhaps more than that, the division, the political division within the United States, the lack of a political agreement as to how to proceed, no? this has made it very difficult for the United States to claim any sort of leadership going forward. Just think of this, for example. The only country, the only G20 country that has not ratified the 2010 reform of the IMF is the United States, the only one. But it's sufficiently large to block the entry into force. It's in the company of uh, countries that are torn by civil war, by acute instability like Zimbabwe, Libya, uh, I believe Afghanistan. Even a country like uh, Iraq, I believe, has ratified, despite all its internal turmoil. So this weakens enormously the, the, the credibility of the United States. Now, having said that, I think it's important to note that there's a sort of void in terms of governance, international governance, because as the U Europeans and Americans decline in their capacity to ex exercise leadership, you, should, you do not see a corresponding capacity from the side of the emerging markets to assert a, a, a role. You do not. We have a, severe limitations, you know, even psychological. <laughs> if you go to the G20 context, for example, you see often that the most outspoken delegates are still the Americans, the Europeans. They, they still dominate the discussion you know, in, in a major respect. So th there's a lot of inertia that makes the situation a bit dangerous because the United States and Europe no longer are capable of leading 
and the others that are becoming larger and more important, in economic terms at least, do not have, again, le leaving a little bit of modesty aside, I think Brazil is perhaps, does a pretty good job, you know, despite its, its relative l lesser weight. We punch above our weight in terms of discussions. <laughs> and often we get punched back. <laughs> But anyway, I think the, the main point is that you have a void there, you know, that may, that may be sort of dangerous, maybe sort of dangerous. But um, Luis Fernando de Paula, about the Mercosul, I think uh, what you can say is this, the view in Brazil, say 10 years ago, was that the, the major platform for Brazil's international projection would be Mercosul and South America, right? I wonder if this has become true. I think it hasn't, because for many reasons. Brazil is close to all its neighbors, gets along very well with all its neighbors, has its disagreements, of course, but plays a balancing role, I believe. But it has the situation in Latin America has not favored very much the articulation, for example, in the in the in the in the in the IMF or in the BRICS in the G20 context, I would say to you that Brazil's closest allies are the other BRICS, not the other Latin Americans. We get along well with the other Latin Americans. But it's not we don't rely, we can't rely as much on them. So I think there's been a, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we, we are close to them. Huh? We, help, we, have, we help, we're always together with Argentina. <laughs> no doubt about that, I, I do that in particular. But um, this is, the, the truth of the matter is that in terms of international policy, international economic and financial policy, our main allies in practice have been, in recent years at least, at least the other BRICs, uh, more than our neighbors here. Yeah. Our neighbors are divided in two, roughly speaking, two groups, no? the Pacific Arc no? and the Bolivarian Argentinian group. No? They're very different, very heterogeneous. Brazil does not side completely with, with, with either of them. No? tries to play a balancing act. But the balancing act is difficult, huh? very difficult. Huh? So that's, uh, I'm not sure I replied to your question, but that's what I. <laughs> and finally, Paul, uh, on the question of the tug of war. Huh? This is one of the main, uh, between emerging markets and, and advanced countries, this is one of the main governance deficiencies of the Bretton Woods institutions. Huh? There's an unwritten rule, it's unwritten, that the presidency of the World Bank is reserved for an American national and the presidency of, and the managing director role of the IMF was reserved for a European national. This was, came about by accident, you know, because uh, the, initially the idea was to have an American head the IMF, white. But as when he was going to be nominated as the first managing director of the, of the IMF, revelations about his collaboration with the Soviet Union came to the knowledge of the American president, and he was then not nominated managing director. So then the tradition was established to give it to a European, and we had 11 Europeans since then. Now this is really ridiculous, huh? Ridiculous. How can you have this, um, this, this reservation from a geographical point of view. One of the commitments we had, we have in the G20 is to have a, a transparent, merit-based selection. That goes back to the agreements at the level of the G20, 2008, 2009, expressed in communiques. What happened when Dominique Strauss-Kahn was arrested? Um, the Europeans came forward very quickly with the name of Lagarde. And even before the end of the registration period for candidacies, before other candidates had appeared, all European governments, including G20 members, said, we support 
Madame Lagarde. How can you choose on the basis of merit before the selection process, <laughs> before the indication process is over? So it's really very uh, unhappy. Now the question is, will when the next when the top job becomes available, will the emerging markets coalesce into a name? What was the difficulty we had last time? When we, you approach possible strong names from emerging markets, you tend to get a negative. Why? Because nobody wants to run, a, or very few people are willing to run a protest candidacy. And given the distribution of voting power in the bank and in the, in the fund, the European bloc plus United States plus a few others, Canada, Japan, have more than 50 percent of voting power. So as long as there's no clear indication that the, the unwritten rule is gone, you, it's very difficult for us to, to make strong names from non-European uh, or non-American, in the case of the World Bank, interested. In the case of the World Bank position, which was last year, uh, we, we did have a strong emerging market country uh, candidate, the Nigerian finance minister. And she did a good, quite a good showing, but it's, I tell you, it's very difficult to persuade strong names to come to an election where the election has a predetermined result. So the first step, with the, really, the really lasting solution to this is the redistribution of voting power. That's a, the real lasting solution. Pending that, a clear, clearly stated commitment on the part of the U.S. and the, and the European Union that they would not strive for the application of this rule. We have not had that. I wonder if an American president can do that. Because the, the idea is that the World Bank is American territory, right? And if the Americans don't do it, the, the Europeans feel free to continue to hold the Americans accountable for honoring their part of the deal in the fund. So we have this, if the top job becomes available soon, I, th I think we would face the, 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 the same difficulty that we had in 2011. Um, there may be a relationship. Sorry, let's take more than one question. Yes, Albert Kyle. You mentioned uh, very briefly that China is kind of mysterious and hard to understand. Um, and I wonder, uh, China not being an ally of the United States and sort of an, an outsider of uh, all kinds of arrangements, uh, if, if there is uh, some sense within the IMF that uh, China is a, a, a disturbance of some kind. I don't know how to say it, that it's, uh, that the, the message comes through that we really need to uh, play down uh, the China song, not let it get to the top charts. from uh, Fundação Getúlio Vargas. Uh, just a quick question about the WTO. So now, I mean, we haven't talked at all about the WTO, and I think maybe its role has been very constrained to the tariff uh, type of stories and dumping and so on. But now we have a Brazilian director at the WTO. How does that play? I mean, does that change at all? Does that, is, that, is there any kind of coordination uh, with uh, the Brazilian, uh, I don't know, role at the fund and at the World Bank? Does that help? Just a curiosity. So, Jan, about, uh, I'm not aware of any connection between the, the BRICS-led planned development bank and Banco do Sul. 
it could it could arise in the future, but I'm not. I, I don't think it's become a major issue so far. No. On China in the IMF, China has adopted a very cautious stance in the IMF. It's aware of the risk of being seen as a disturbance. It doesn't want to be seen as a disturbance. It wants to be respected. It wants to have a role. No? But it, it takes the long view, always. It, um, it, uh, it, it's, it's, it's low key. The stance is often low key. And um, they, they stress the, the, what a lot of East Asians do, the, the cooperation, the consensus tradition. At the same time, they are seen by the, uh, in the United States in a very problematic way. I mean, I think the Americans have a lot of difficulty in accepting the fact that in sometime soon, they will no longer be the largest economy in the world. This is, for the, for the Americans, it's very difficult to accept. You can say to them, well, this doesn't mean that you won't be the most influential power for a long, long time. They're going, oh, but no. <laughs> Psychologically, it's difficult. You know? <laughs> so China, despite the low key it attempts to play, is often facing this difficulty. No. The, the Chinese don't challenge it frontally. They make their points, but in a very discreet way. They normally, almost always, authorize publication with no major, no major changes. So it's their approach is to make their points, but not to engage in heavy-handed polemics with staff, and diff or to. They, they avoid, I've never seen in all these years the Chinese do anything similar to what you did in your presentation, to present their experience as a model, as a reference. They never do it, which is possibly, maybe it's not useful, but it's possibly a wise decision given the, the reactions that <laughs> they can, they can. But Laura from the Fajulu Vargas, I, uh, I'm not, very familiar with the details of the WTO. I, I sense that it, it, the fund is risking to, to, the IMF is risking to repeat the experience of WTO in the sense of a fragmentation of the multilateral level because of ch difficulties to move forward at the, at, at, a fragmentation at the regional level or trans-regional because of the difficulties of moving forward with the, with the multilateral level. But uh, keep in mind that it's important for Brazil that a Brazilian won the, pos the position. Very important. It's, I think it's the highest post a Brazilian ever had in international organizations. But keep in mind that he's there. He's, he's not there as a Brazilian representative, right? Although I hope he will not forget that he's Brazilian. <laughs> <laughs> so when we interact with him, we, should, we, would, we need to take that into account. The more natural thing for us is to interact with the Brazilian ambassador in Geneva, which is the, who is the counterpart to, to the Brazilian director at the fund or at the bank. You know? We've not done that enough, I, th I agree. I think the coordination there has been poor. It's improving now because I, since last year, I have a, a vice director who's unusually, by the way, who's an Argentinian. Argentina is not part of our constituency, but I managed to appoint an Argentinian on merit. He's an, and I am, he's a WTO staff, so he's he's heavily engaged with WTO issues, and he's making the bridge, including with Roberto. So I think this will improve, and this may be an example of Argentinian Brazilian collaboration at the micro level. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I'm not familiar enough with the issues at the WTO to properly respond to your question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.